الحضور الكريم لقد أصبح الابتكار أحد المفاهيم المهمة في إثراء إدارة المشاريع بل أصبح الركيزة الداعمة للقيادة الواثقة لتمكينها من التعامل مع متطلبات المستقبل حول هذا الموضوع يتحدث السيد توم كيلي الشريك الإداري لشركة آي دي يو ومؤلف بعض الكتب الأكثر مبيعا مثل الثقة المبدعة وفن الابتكار وأوجه الابتكار العشرة فليتفضل لإلقاء محاضرته Good morning. I'm going to talk today about leading with creative confidence, about how you as leaders and you as project managers can use the tools of design thinking and you can bring out the creative confidence in the people that work for you. I've been working on this concept of creative confidence for more than a decade now, and what I've noticed is that when I first start talking about it, say if I'm sitting on an airplane and, and uh, I talk about creative confidence, people seem to know exactly what I mean. And they'll say, oh, you know what that makes me think of? And then they start telling me a story about their creativity or about their confidence. And then what happens is very often they will pause and they'll say, wait, what do you mean exactly creative confidence? And so I've learned that it helps to start with the definition of terms. And so I would say that creative confidence is two things in almost equal parts. And the first part is the natural human ability to come up with a great idea, right? Some fresh, innovative idea, and everyone has this. Everyone has this in them, and as I say that, you may know someone in your life, maybe it's someone you work with, maybe it's someone you're married to, that you think maybe doesn't have all this creativity, and I would argue, yes, it is there, it might be buried a little deeper in some people than others, right? But that's that natural human ability that everyone has, that creativity, but that is not the whole story. Because equally important is the other half, it's not just the natural ability, it's the courage to act. It is the courage to leap, right? It's the courage to stand up for your idea. Right? And sometimes, as I did interviews on this subject, and I interviewed more than a hundred people in preparation for a book on this subject, when I talk to people, especially young people, especially people at the bottom of the organization, what I find is they tell me stories about how they're in a meeting, some important meeting related to the project that they are currently working on. And there's a challenge, there's a problem that you, as you may have noticed, in the middle of projects there are often problems, right? And this young person will tell me, I had an idea that I thought would help. And they kind of start to raise their hand in the meeting to express their idea, and then they pause. And then they look around and they think, wait a minute. They look around the room and figuratively they look around the entire organization that they work for and they think, oh, maybe I shouldn't raise my hand, right? Maybe if I raise my hand, people will think I'm different. Maybe they'll think I'm weird. Maybe I'll provoke that person called the devil's advocate, right, to, to criticize my ideas. And so what they tell me time after time after time, they tell me, decided not to raise my hand, right? And the truth is, we don't even know yet, was it a good idea? Right? Until you get the idea out on the table, until people with more experience and more seniority have a chance to debate about it or build on it or modify it, we don't know if it was an idea worth implementing or not. But we need that idea to come out. We as senior leaders need to hear the idea so that we can use our judgment, you know, our experience to decide if this is an idea we should, we should take forward. Right? And so all of our organizations, all of us as individuals need both. We need that natural ability to come up with a creative idea, but we also need the courage to act. And so that's really creative confidence at its heart. I've worked on the creative side of business for more than 30 years. And it felt like, early in my career, that we were right at the edge of, of industry. That we were off 
you know, in America we have this thing you may not have called the kids' table. You know, the grown-ups sit over here and they talk about, you know, important things, and the kids sit over at the side and play, right? I felt like I was at the kids' table. While the serious business of the enterprise was happening in conference rooms and boardrooms down the hall. But luckily, for me at least, luckily, the world has come in our direction, right? Organizations of all kinds around the world have discovered that creativity is important to their work. It's essential in most industries today, right? And so I was really happy when we got actual data on this uh, Adobe Corporation, a company that all of you probably know, giant software company, did some research a few years ago. They did a survey, 5,000 people in five different countries. So a pretty global survey where they looked at creativity at work. The whole survey is called State of Create. You can look up all of the questions online. I'm just going to talk about two of them today, the two that got my interest the most. And the first question is this one about, is creativity central? Is it in the heart of the matter or is it off at the edge? Right? And when Adobe asked the world that question, the answer was yes, it is very central. Because what the answer showed was that 80% of respondents around the world said that creativity was critical, that unlocking creativity was critical to economic growth. I love that they worded the question this way, unlocking creativity. Because you know that is our challenge as leaders, as project managers, to unlock it. We don't have to give our people creative creativity. We don't have to teach them to be creative. It is there. We've got to find a way to unlock it. So this is a very strong consensus saying, yes, it is central. It is critical to economic growth. But if you think about it, this is an easy question. This is just an opinion question. What do you think about the world? We can answer these kind of questions really easily. The next question is a lot harder. The next question is about you. Do you have a chance to live up to your creative potential? Do you have a chance to bring your whole self to work? And when Adobe asked the world this question, sadly, wait, go back one? Where was I? Sadly, this was the answer. Only 25% of people said yes. Only 25% said they had a chance to live up to their creative potential. Right? And this is scary. I mean, this should be scary to all of us as leaders. Right? Have you noticed that here in the 21st century, we are always resource constrained? Right? We are always trying to do more with less. Right? As you manage your projects, you've probably noticed you never have as much schedule as you would like to have. You never have quite as much budget. Right? We are short of all kinds of natural resources. We live in a resource constrained environment. So in that environment, if we are, if we are wasting this one, you know, in a way, I would say for us senior leaders, shame on us if we are going to let 75% of this creative resource run down the drain every day. When I saw this data from Adobe, I thought, wow, here's a challenge. Here's a challenge for all leaders, but here's certainly a challenge for me. If you do the math of it, I think it is probably safe guess that I might be playing in the fourth quarter of my career. You get to that fourth quarter, you start thinking about legacy, you start thinking about purpose, right? What is it that I want to do with the remaining years of my career? And I'm thinking this is a worthy question. Well, this one actually, the 25% is kind of depressing, but the, the worthy question is, the flip side of that is, how might we unlock the creative confidence of the other 75%? Because think of that. Think of we as individuals, if we as organizations, as we as a region, Think if we can do that, if we can get up near the 100% of the creative potential of our organization, of our team, while others are stuck at 25%, well, that's not even a fair fight at that point, right? That is a source of very long-term strategic competitive advantage. And so this is a worthy goal for leaders everywhere. So I'm going to talk about three elements of creative competence and the things we have worked with, with our teams and with our client teams, and how we nurture that creative competence in people. But before I get to the, the specific elements of it, I just want to tell you a case study uh, that I bumped into when I was doing research in the book that kind of cuts across all of them, that, that describes creative competence in kind of its purest form. So this is a story about a woman named Jill, and Jill works for us 
at IDEO. And Jill came to IDEO thinking, like many, perhaps most people in the world, thinking, no, no, I'm not creative. Jill, by the way, is a really wonderful cook. She's a, she's a, she makes these beautiful cakes, these decorated cakes, and brings them to the office. And they're so beautiful, Jill's cakes, that you don't even want to eat them. Of course, we do eat them, because they're delicious too. But you, you, you feel like it's a work of art. I shouldn't be eating this. But then Jill will say, oh, no, no, I'm not creative. She says, I didn't make up the recipe for this cake. I just was following instructions. And so it's like, OK, Jill, if you insist on believing that. And by the way, in case Jill wasn't sure about where she stood with this creative versus non-creative, Jill came to us from the advertising industry. Anybody work in an ad agency here? Yes, yeah, so some hands going up. So as you may know, if you don't work for an ad agency, very typically, the ad agency has a department that's called the creatives. Right? It's not always that exact word, but often it is. That's the creative department over there. And so imagine that you're like Jill, and you work for an ad agency, but you're not in the creative department. Draw your own conclusions. What does that mean? That means you're in the non-creative department. Right? And so Jill's walking around this week, no, I'm not creative. And so people believe in the kind of Venn diagram of you know, humanity. They think there's this really special circle, this very select few that are the creative ones. And yeah, I wish I was in that circle, but I'm not. Right? And people believe this. And Jill believed this. And then a really fun thing happened. Jill, just on her own, really mostly outside of work, Jill starts playing around with a website called Pinterest. Anybody on Pinterest here? So, okay, so yes, some, some men's hands went up too. Um, I've had the Pinterest people over, and men, they don't know you exist, is all I can tell you. They, when they talk about their customer, they usually talk about she. What, what's she gonna want, what can we do for her, right? And Pinterest, if you haven't visited, it's a very visual site. It's actually quite a beautiful website, and you, you put up photos with captions and descriptions, and each of those posts is called a pin, right? And so. You put up your pins and then you get followers. And Jill starts playing with Pinterest and she starts pinning things. And Jill suddenly has six followers. Jill, not coincidentally, has six girlfriends, right? And so all the girlfriends are following Jill, which is great. That's how we support our friends. But Jill's stuff is really good, right? And next thing she knows, she has 100 followers and then she has 1,000 followers. And then Jill, Pins, one of the most successful pins in the hint history of Pinterest. She does this pin about a certain kind of cookie. And in order to tell this story, I'm going to back up just for one second, and I'm going to say there is this word that hopefully is familiar to some of you, but probably not all of you, and the word is piñata. It's a, it's a very common in California where I live, right next to Mexico. It is very, very common for a kid's birthday party. If you have an eight-year-old birthday party, you get this paper mache object. It is filled with candy. And then you get the kids, and you don't want too old of kids, or it gets, it gets dangerous. And they take a bat, and they, they, they whack at, the, at, the, at this, this thing that's usually in the shape of a donkey, by the way, a, a mule, whatever. And, um, and eventually, if they hit it enough, it breaks, and the candy comes out, and then the kids all scramble, and they get the candy. Right? So, after that quick review, so that's a piñata. But she didn't do a pin about piñatas. Her pin was about piñata cookies. And let me just say, if you're ever thinking of making these piñata cookies for your kids, you better love those kids. Because this cookie takes about 17 hours to make. You got to roll it out the night before. You got seven different colors of dough. You put it in the refrigerator. In the morning, you make It's not really a cookie. It's really three cookies because it's got the top and the bottom, and then in the middle cookie, you take a juice glass and you cut a circle, and then you, you glue all the, and then you put candies in the circle, and then you kind of glue them all together with icing, and then you've spent 17 hours, and the kid will eat this cookie in 17 seconds. It's like, whoa, oh, that was good, right? But Jill posts this photo about these pinata cookies, and next thing Jill knows, she's got 100,000 followers. Right? And Pinterest, you know, they got big data, like everyone else. Pinterest says, hey, wait, look at that, right? Because they're following, they're following all of our lines. You know, that always happens online. But then suddenly this one line, Jill's line goes, whoosh, has this kind of hockey stick. 
Ooh, hockey, probably not big in Dubai, but anyhow, has this curve that goes suddenly straight upwards, and so they interview Jill, and they put her on the Pinterest homepage, and Jill gets so much notoriety for being on the Pinterest homepage that she ends up with a million followers, right? And you get a million followers on whatever social network you're on, this is, you know, partly intimidating, but partly really, really fun. And what happened? in acquiring a million followers is Jill was transformed. Jill went from, I'm not creative, to, you know what, I am creative, but in a different way. Mm. She says, I don't make up the recipes for things. She says, I'm not a, I can't paint. I'm not good at drawing. But my followers, my million followers, tell me I have a creative eye. I'm a curator of creative ideas. And so, I, by the way, did not hear the story from Jill. I heard this story from Jill's mother. I met her mom one day in Los Angeles, you know, about an hour's flight south of where I live. And she says, do you know my daughter? And I said, yes, kind of. She says, well, my daughter is glowing. She says, you should see my daughter. She is completely different, right? Think about what happened to Jill. What Jill really did, if you think about it, if you step back from it a little bit, what Jill did was she stretched that circle a little bit of who those creatives are. And she stretched that circle just enough that suddenly Jill could step inside the circle instead of being outside the way she felt her whole life. And it wasn't just something that happened inside of Jill's brain. I mean, that in itself would have been worthwhile. That's called self-actualization. But no, as a, her employer, I love that it transformed her behavior. Jill now willing to take on tougher projects, right? Because if you think you're not creative, it's like, no, that one sounds hard. No, I, I, I need a different project, right? But she knows she's creative now. It's like, bring it on. She's, she's got more courage at the beginning of a project when courage is often needed. Right? She's got more resilience in the middle of a project, because if you've probably noticed, there are problems sometimes along the way on the road to innovation. And she's got more stamina at the end, because at the end of projects, wow, it has been a long march, and you're ready for it to be there. And, and so Jill has transformed at work. We've noticed it. Her clients have noticed it. Jill has transformed her career and her life because she got creative confidence. Right? And so that opportunity is out there for all of us. And for a room full of leaders, that opportunity is available to the people who work for you. And let me just say, if you can make this happen for your team, you just watch how much fun it is to be around them and how much more productive and, you know, they are at work and how they emerge as leaders because of their creative confidence. And so this is a worthy goal. This is worth nurturing in the people on our projects. So that's the story of Jill, but I want to go on to the, the three ideas, the three elements of how we nurture uh, creative confidence in our team members and in our client teams. And the first of the three is about blending technology with humanity. Right? I live and work in the Silicon Valley, and we love technology in the Silicon Valley. And it turns out that if you think about humans before you launch your technology in the world, it's more likely that your technology will be embraced. Right? I'm going to guess that none of you arrived here at this location riding a Segway today, and that none of you are going to go home and pet your robotic dog. Right? Those are two actually pretty amazing technologies you know, from the last 20 years, except that no one actually wanted one. Right? In America, the, those segways are used only in shopping malls, only by security people. Right? So if you start with humans, if you think about all the humans, and that's, the, that's your constituents, it's your team members, it's the, it's the repair people, it's the people skilled and unskilled who will come into contact with your new offering. Right? If you think about that, just watch how your technology gets embraced, how, how much more popular it can be. And so, I, as I said, I interviewed 100 people, and of, my, of the 100 people, this is probably my favorite uh, of the people I interviewed. And for those of you in the RTA, if, you've, if this story sounds familiar, um, hopefully it will hold up to a second telling. 
But this is a guy named Doug Dietz, and he works for General Electric. He works in the GE Healthcare Group that does these medical scanners. These really amazing machines. If you think about it, those CT scanners and MRIs are really quite amazing. You know, when I was a kid, there used to be this thing called exploratory surgery, where they just say, like, well, let's just open them up and see what's happening in there. Right? We don't do that anymore. And the reason we don't is because, magically, these, these machines use technology to peer in great detail inside the human body and tell us what's going on. Right? So we can do exactly the right surgery. We can avoid surgery whenever possible. Right? And so Doug's been doing this a long time, and he's a veteran at GE, and he makes these machines that take a very long time to make, a couple of years, two and a half year cycle typically for a new MRI machine or a CT scanner that goes through that cycle. And having just gone through that cycle, he's got a new machine coming out in the world. And for GE, this humanity part is they have this thing they call voice of the customer, where they go out and observe and ask questions and try to understand what works and what doesn't work, which is great. But Doug, looking back on it now, realizes that it was very, it was, the, the questions they were asking are a little too narrow. Doug goes and he asks the technician with, on his new machine, he says the same questions he has always asked. He says, in fact, every question I asked was aimed at patting me on the back. Did you notice this new feature? Did you notice this software update? Did you notice how we made, the, you know, we, we fixed that one problem from before? Right, all the same questions, asks his questions, gets the answers he's hoping for, and is getting ready to leave the room, the scanning suite where his machine is located. But as he's getting to leave that day, he actually ran into some humans. He ran into a six-year-old girl who was about to be scanned in Doug's CT scanner, and her mom and her dad. And the girl is crying, and the, and the, the, the parents have tension written all over their face. And the, as, as he passes them in the doorway, he hears the dad in a kind of a whisper say to his daughter, Honey, we talked about this. You can be strong, right? And Doug, this seems unbelievable to me. He's a veteran in this industry, but he honestly does not know what he's seeing. But to his great credit, he goes back in search of knowledge. He goes back to the operator, to the technician who runs his machine and says, hey, hey, what's up here? He says, you got a problem patient today? Right, and isn't this what we always think? When people fail to understand the brilliance and wonderfulness of our new offering, must be something wrong with them, right? He's sure that there's a problem with this patient. But the problem's not with this patient, the problem's with Doug's machine. The technician gives him this funny look and says, Doug, Doug, you never asked me about this. You know, your machine scares the heck out of kids. In fact, Doug, you've never asked me about this either. You know, your machine is so scary that we have to anesthetize more than 80% of our pediatric patients. We have to put them to sleep so they can endure the process of being in your machine. And Doug, who's this really sensitive guy, has this hard reset. He, he, he goes home to his wife and he says, I might have to change jobs. I'm going to have to change careers because he's always been so proud of his industry, you know, the healthcare industry. And now, he, his new self-image is, I make machines that scare little children, <laughs> right? So he tells his boss this, right? And now there's a little career risk in doing that, but he does it anyhow because he's prepared to, you know, leave the business if he has to, to fix this in his brain, right? And his boss sends him to a program at Stanford University. There's a new um, program there. It's called the D School, D as in design thinking, which is this practice of designers you know, applied to bigger problems in the world. And the number one rule at the D School at Stanford, if you go to the executive ed program there, as Doug did, number one rule is always start with empathy. And Doug's like, what? Start with empathy, right? Uh, that's not what they taught me at GE, right? But he did, and he listened. And Doug was there with people from all over the world, so diverse cultures and people from different departments of their companies, right? It wasn't just R&D people there. And so while Doug is there, he gets an idea. Right, and it's just like those ideas that the young people have in the meeting, gotta have the courage to raise your hand. And so Doug does, he goes back home, goes back and he talks to his boss, and his boss is boss, and he gives him this pitch, you know, that we gotta do this, here's what I wanna do. And I've been to GE many times, I'm gonna ask somebody at GE, I would love to hear their side of this story about how they support innovation and they, 
you know, they were helping Doug all the way. I don't know exactly what was said in the meeting. I would love to know exactly what was said. But I do know one thing exactly for sure. I know that Doug came away from that meeting with a budget of exactly zero. Right? And I'm sure it's the same here in Dubai as it is in everywhere in the world, which is budget is how organizations express love. Right? So you get no budget, you got no love. Right? And Doug's got no love at all for his idea, and that he is not going to let that stop him. So he gets a volunteer group from GE, he gets people from that children's hospital. Very importantly, he recruited some people from a local children's museum that understand how to talk to kids. And together, this all-volunteer team created a whole, what is now a whole new series of products for GE, and it's called the GE Adventure Series Scanner, <laughs> right? And a skeptic would say, Doug, all you really did is put some graphics on the machine. Well, yeah, for a start. Graphics on the machine and the floors and the walls and the ceiling, they created, a, you know, like a theme park experience in that scanning suite. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is with the help of that children's museum, they wrote a script for every machine. You know, the old, the old script was like, lie down, sit still, machine on now. That's basically the old script. New script says, you know, each one has to be unique. Each one's different because it's a designed experience. And this was actually the first one. This is a CT scanner. And the script for this one sounds something like this. The technician will, you know, put him on the table as he's going into the machine, the little boy, and she, she'll say, now, Johnny, today we're going inside a pirate ship. And it's not a scary pirate ship, by the way. It's a kind of a theme park pirate ship, right? Today we're going inside the pirate ship. And when you're in that pirate ship, you've got to lie perfectly still. Because, Johnny, if you move, the pirate might catch you. So, Johnny, do you think you can lie perfectly still? And yes, there's empirical data and there's academic studies that say absolutely yes, Johnny can lie perfectly still because the rate of anesthesiology at that hospital goes from over 80% to under 10%. Right? And Doug, who as I said is very sensitive, says to me, Tom, I would love to tell you we got it to zero. He says, I can't get to zero, there are other medical complications, but I can get it under 10%. Right? And so, Doug says, you know, everybody in my world has metrics. You got metrics in your world? Of course you do. You're, you know, you, you understand complex projects, right? He says, GE is really happy with their metrics. Sales go up, market share goes up, lots of positive publicity. He says, the hospital really happy because these machines are really expensive. And if you can skip the whole anesthesiology step, you can get a lot more people scanned in every machine. You can get a lot more value out of that machine if you can do the scans quicker. Doug says, let them keep their, let them keep their measures. Here's my measure. Doug was back. He goes back all the time now. He says, I don't talk to that technician. She's got nothing for me. I talk to the moms. I talk to the dads. Right? I talk to the patients. And he's there talking to a young mom one day whose daughter's just been scanned in his machines. And they're chatting about things. And their little girl who's just been scanned comes up and starts tugging her mom's skirt. Mommy, mommy, mommy. You know, she's talking to Doug. But eventually she looks down and she says, yes, dear, what is it? Little girl looks up at her mom and says, Mommy, can we come back tomorrow? <laughs> says, there's my metric. There's my metric. She says, let GE have, GE have theirs. Let the hospital have theirs. That's my metric. Mommy, can we come back tomorrow? I used to scare the heck out of kids, and now I've gotten all the way to, Mommy, can we come back tomorrow? Think about what Doug did. Doug did not touch the technology. The technology, as I said, was already amazing. Doug didn't touch the technology. In fact, he's not allowed to touch the technology because then you go back through the two and a half year cycle and the regulatory approval. Doug didn't touch it at all. Doug blended the technology with humanity in just the right way. Reinventing his product category, reinventing his career, right? Reinventing his industry, right? And so that's creative confidence. Doug now, by the way, totally changed his career. Doug is now an ambassador across this giant global organization of GE for this methodology, for this design thinking idea where you start with empathy, where you blend all your wonderful technologies with just the right of human amount of humanity, right? And so that gets you one step closer to creative confidence. So 
An element of this, using this approach, blending humanity in, is you have to be prepared to meet people where they are, to really observe human behavior closely. And sometimes if you do this, if you take enough care and you have enough patience, you'll see that you actually understand people better than they understand themselves. You know, it's wonderful to get, for example, survey data. It's wonderful to get it at your desk at work, right? It's air conditioned at your desk, right? Very handy here in Dubai, right? You've got your coffee or your tea right there. You're surrounded by colleagues that you know. It's so wonderfully comfortable to get all of your data right there at your desk. But sometimes, especially at the front end of innovation, the data reaching you at your desk has been filtered a little too much. Right? And so that's why we always go out in the world. We don't even bring people into our office to observe. We follow them home. And so out of our Munich office, we were sitting at the, in the home of this elderly woman. And we were asking her questions. Our client that day was a pharmaceutical company. <coughs> we were asking her questions about pills and how, you know, like, do the pill bottles give her any trouble? And she's got arthritis, as you can see, and it affects her dexterity. And she says to us, and it's been translated from the German, so I mean, this may not be word for word what she says, but basically what she communicates is she says, oh, no, medicine bottles don't give me any real trouble. Right? This is a pretty clear message. Right? Imagine that you're sitting at your desk with the air conditioning, with the hot cup of tea right beside you, and you get this data in the, in the comments section of a, of a survey, an online survey or written survey, what would you be tempted to conclude? Sure, no one would blame you for concluding that with respect to this person at least, this customer, this patient, this human, with respect to this person, they don't have a problem. Good, we're all good here, right? Except the old lady is lying. You don't know sitting at your desk that she's lying, but we know because we're sitting in her living room looking at her hands and looking at this little tiny bottle. And so we said, could you show us? And by the way, these people aren't lying maliciously. You know, there's, they're, they're not trying to deceive you. They're kind of sort of deceiving themselves, right? And so this is why you gotta see, you gotta see with your own eyes. So we said, could you show us? And since she doesn't think she's lying, she says, oh, sure, sure, follow me. And so we do. And so our team follows this elderly woman into the kitchen, at which point the elderly woman approaches the meat slicer with her little bottle in her hand. Right, and I don't know about you, but I've seen this photograph several times, and every time I just zoom in, so I'll zoom in a little bit for you, and I'm thinking, how many millimeters is her finger from that spinning blade? And by the way, one of our German engineers who was there and says, Yes, and does that uh, meat slicer still slice beef? You know, like, we're, we've got empathy for the old lady, he's got empathy for the meat slicer. Like, oh, that's going to be tough on the meat slicer. Yeah, it's going to be really, really tough on the old lady when she starts, you know, s splitting parts of her fingers off on the other end of the machine. Right? you have got to solve this problem. And as often happens, you know, this problem is pretty easy to fix. But you have to know the problem exists. And to know that problem exists, you can't be at your desk. You've got to be with the old lady in the kitchen. Right? And this is true even on the giant projects. When you go in the field and you see people, the way people install things or the way they, they keep track of their tools or they, you know, the, the, the way that they implement your great plans, you will see, hopefully not this exactly, but you will see these anomalies. You will see problems that you can fix if you know what's happening, right? And sometimes you can fix it with information, and sometimes you fix it with new design, and sometimes you, you change the plan to accommodate so that you prevent people from doing basically crazy stuff, right? But in order to do that, you gotta observe. You, you can't just ask people questions, because they will not always give it up. They will lie to you, you know, even if they don't mean to. So philosophically, there's this French essayist, Marcel Proust, from a long time ago, who said, you know, the real act of discovery consists not in finding new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. And the seeing with new eyes gets harder and harder to do as you progress through your career. You know, because a lot of senior people in the room here, and with your seniority and your expertise, you know, it is so valuable to the organizations you work in. But as all of us develop our industry expertise, we kind of train ourselves to screen out the distractions and the anomalies. And sometimes in today's world, the distraction, the anomaly, is today's opportunity. 
And so you have to be on the lookout for that all the time. And so we used to have a, there was a CEO, uh, A.G. Lafley, CEO of Procter & Gamble, would bring his entire senior management, his top 40 people, the Global Leadership Council, bring them to California once a year so that we could go out in the field and start with empathy and look for ways to blend their technology with humanity. And we would say to these people, because very, very senior, like many people in the room today, and we'd say, we know you're the experts, right? And we respect your expertise. And just today, just for purposes of learning, we want you to set some of that expertise aside so you can see with new eyes in the way that Marcel Proust talked about. Right? And we believe in this so much we've coined a term, really kind of borrowed a term to describe the mental state that we're trying to get senior people into to see with fresh eyes. And it's not this word, right? You, you know this word. In fact, I'm guessing it goes untranslated into Arabic the way it does in most languages of the world, right? Deja vu, been there before, right? But that's not the mental state we're trying to get into. Everybody knows about that. It's in the dictionary. No, what we're trying to get people into is the mental state, the opposite of this one. And since it's the opposite, we call it bujade. <laughs> and bujade is when you're in a place you've been a thousand times before, maybe the lobby of your own building, maybe day one of a project, you know, maybe this, you know, the, the front page of your website, and you start, to, you start to see it with fresh eyes. You see it the way one of your new employees would see it on their first day at work. And if you can just at least once in a while look at things with fresh eyes, if you can get in this mental state of vujade, you can see opportunities. And there are thousands of these you know, around the world. I'll, I'll give you one example of personal experience. But I fly a lot. I fly every week. And uh, so anybody ever heard that safety video on the airlines? Right? Like, you've all heard it, right? I've heard it a thousand times. But one particular day, I was actually listening because Let's be honest, a lot of it you don't listen to, right? I'm really listening, and there's that moment, or at least on the airline I was flying that day, I was on my way to Sao Paulo, Brazil that day, and they start talking about this yellow oxygen mask, right, that descends from the ceiling in case of trouble. Anybody ever see that yellow oxygen mask come down? Uh, I don't see any hands, but if someone near you has their hand up, oh yeah, there's one. Okay, that person has a story, right? Because if you ever see that yellow oxygen mask, you're having a bad day, right? You don't want to see that mask. Right, so the mask comes down, you have to pull it to turn it on, and they're not very specific about how hard to pull it. You don't want to pull it out of its socket, of course. But then they get to this interesting point on the day that I'm finally listening to this thing for the first time. They start talking about that clear plastic bag attached to the yellow oxygen mask. And what they said that day, and it varies a little from airline to airline, and aircraft to aircraft. But what they said that day was, although that clear plastic bag may not inflate, and same airline, different aircraft, they said, although the bag does not inflate, I'm thinking, okay, those aren't the same thing, but okay, does it inflate or does it not inflate? I don't know, but they said, although the bag may not inflate, oxygen is flowing to the mask. And I have this bujade moment, I think, wait a minute, they're apologizing, aren't they? What they're really saying, if you think about that a little bit, what they're really saying is, sorry, we've got this very, very important piece of equipment on this aircraft with no interface at all. Right? In the history of bad interfaces, you know, when I was a kid, they hadn't invented LEDs yet. I know the young people in the room can't imagine a time before LEDs, but no LEDs. And so when I was a kid, the steam irons of my childhood, you know, when my mom would iron shirts, the steam irons of my childhood would just heat up. They would just get hot. And then, I know to the young people in the room, this will sound absurd, we would lick our finger and put it to the face of a hot iron. And then, if you're wondering, yes, of course we burned our fingers. Of course we did. It's a hot iron. But having burned our finger on the face of a hot iron, we knew for darn sure the thing was on. As opposed to the slightly more piece of, important piece of equipment on the airline where the first time you're sure that thing isn't on is when you pass out. Right? And so they're apologizing. But is my point that they should, they should you know, redesign that mask on that airline? No. I mean, of course they should. And I will, I will tell them about green flashing LEDs myself. I will pay for the one on my mask at least. Happy to do that, but not my point. My point is, how did I miss it? How did I miss it 999 times before that one day when I noticed? Right? And that is Bujade. And if you can kind of exercise this Bujade muscle, 
And I encourage you to look at other people's businesses first, because it's easier to observe this in other people's work. But then look at your own work, and I guarantee you, you will find things like this hidden in plain sight. You just have to, as Marcel Proust said, you just have to look at the world with fresh eyes. So that's the first of the three. It's about blending technology with humanity. I promise the next two will be slightly shorter. The second one is about finding safe ways to experiment. And I want to emphasize the safe part, because what you do when you're building the tallest building in the world or the, you know, the new metro that you know, millions of people are going to use, when you come to market, it's got to be as close to perfect as possible. But in order to get to perfection, you have to be willing to experiment, even knowing that some experiments will fail. I'm currently trying to learn Japanese, right, to learn a second language. And has anybody noticed that if you want to, you know, go for, you know, you hope someday to achieve fluency in, a, in another language, there is no path, no path to fluency until we get to some computer brain interface. There is no path to fluency without first speaking it badly for a very long time, right? Because speaking it badly is how you learn, right? You have to practice. You have to fail a little bit. You get some feedback, and then you get better and better if, you know, on the road to fluency. And so it is with innovation. We have to be willing to have those failures, and as Ed said, to talk about them, to be honest when they happen, to make sure that we learn from them. So in this experimentation and failure like Hall of Fame, there's this guy, Jim Dyson, founder of Dyson Vacuum Cleaners. Uh, hopefully some of you have these. These have made their way to Dubai. They, it's the, it, was a, it was a revolution in vacuum cleaners, a different, completely different technology uh, compared to the vacuum cleaners that were out there. And so in Tokyo, right by my Tokyo office, Dyson has this retail experiment. Right? Many retail experiments currently going on in Dubai. This is the first in the world of its type. It's a Dyson Experience store. And will it work? I don't know. I mean, it's a very expensive piece of real estate. Uh, there's not many products inside. The intent of that store is to help you fall in love with their brand. Right? And will they get a sufficient return on investment? I don't know. But I do know one thing for sure, which is Jim Dyson, founder of this company, is no stranger to experiments. The one data point on that I have is, Having read his book, I know that when Jim made his very first cyclonic vacuum, he first did 5,128 prototypes. Now think about that. 5,000 prototypes? I remember Jim Dyson, I got two questions for the guy. Question number one is, Jim, why'd you count? But if you think of a prototype that doesn't get you to success, if you think of that as a small failure, you'd want to stop counting somewhere before you got to 1,000. You certainly quit before you got to 5,000. But way more important question, and I think it's a question that cuts across all cultures of the world. <clears throat> the other question I really, really want to ask Jim Dyson is, Jim, were you married at the time? <laughs> right? Wow, well, that's a patient spouse. I know lots of Silicon Valley spouses that would say, Jim, get out of the garage. Stop fooling with vacuum cleaners. Get a job, would you? You know, get an income, right? He was fooling around for 5,000 prototypes but he was learning with each round. Jim Dyson knew that he wasn't failing randomly, he was failing forward. And he captured the learning, he examined each failure so that he could learn from it. And with that, he moved forward, and as you may know, he's one of the richest men in the UK today. Because he embraced that failure, because he, he knew that through experimentation, you learn, right? And so we know this about experiments, and yet, we, we are sometimes afraid to experiment because of the possibility that the, each individual experiment will not succeed, right? And my best advice to you on this is, especially when talking to your boss, characterize it as an experiment from the beginning because experiments sometimes fail, but a failed experiment is not a failure and they do not make you a failure. A failed experiment is learning that gets you closer to success. Right, and just to give you one example from our work, my firm IDEO does a lot of, of products and services and we're designing education systems and it's very, um, designing very complex systems now. But some of our work is still products and we do a lot of medical devices and healthcare products. And we were working, this is several years ago now, we're working on a, a tool for sinus surgery. They go up through your nose and they drill up by your brain and so best not to think about that at all. 
But we're working on this tool, and we've, we've started with empathy, we did observations in the operating room, and we're now at the brainstorming stage. And we're in a brainstorm, this is in our Chicago office, and one of our young engineers is not happy with the rate at which we're progressing. And so he leaves the room for five minutes, and comes back with, I think, the ugliest prototype in the history of IDEO. Right? It's a prototype that any kindergartner, any five-year-old in the world could have made. He takes a whiteboard marker, he tapes up kind of a black canister to it, he puts an orange clothespin kind of thing, and he takes it back and hands it to the surgeon who's working on the medical advisory board for this client. Right? And he says, hey, are you thinking of something like this? And by the way, that's a very important moment in the evolution of an innovation, is when you present the unfinished idea. It's not always a prototype, the unfinished idea if people laugh at you, if people ridicule you, you pretty much get the signal like, oh, okay, I only want to have perfect ideas from now on, right? How many perfect ideas you've had recently? I've had none, which means you stop telling your boss ideas, right? Anyhow, Surgeon did not laugh. Surgeon picked up this very fragile prototype and said, yeah, a little bit like this. And so this ugly five-minute prototype helped to crystallize our thinking and we moved forward with many, many prototypes in between, of course, towards the finished product, which is very precise surgical tools, been very successful out in the world. And so the lesson I learned from this product is sometimes you have to find a way to lower the bar. You gotta make it easier for people to express their idea, to express the still imperfect idea. And I know this is a scary idea in the medical advice business, I know on the big projects you work on, and yet, at the front end of innovation, we need that idea, right? And those ideas at the front end that later get tested and built upon and in some cases discarded if they don't bear fruit, we still need that idea. And so if you can lower the bar, you can create an environment in which everyone has ideas and everyone gets a chance to put them forward knowing that their idea will at least be considered, that there will be a meritocracy of ideas in your company and you set up a system for that and you just watch those ideas flow in. I work in the Silicon Valley where the venture capital firms of America are centered. And the VC firms will tell you that all other things equal, the firm with the best what they call deal flow will win. Which is to say the more deals, the more companies coming into them, the better their, their ultimate success rate will be. And it's the same with your company. The more ideas that you have a chance to evaluate during the year, the greater chance you have success, for success, because you're picking from many ideas instead of picking from, from few. So in this prototype, you have to be willing to learn, you have to be willing to listen, and especially when you're part way through a project, and you've got something that you're kind of testing, if there's a failure along the way, you have to be able to acknowledge it, embrace it, and change accordingly. Right, and so this is a young team at Stanford University in a course um, called Design for Extreme Affordability. They were working on infant incubators, you know, for, for infants born premature who need to go in an incubator. What they decided was in places like rural India or Nepal, people can't afford an incubator, the whole, the whole function of an incubator out in the rural villages. But that the single most important thing is to keep that baby warm, to keep it at room, t I mean, at uh, body temperature, you know, 37 degrees centigrade. Right? And so they create this little infant warmer. It's called the Embrace Infant Warmer. It's got a paraffin material inside. You heat it to 37 degrees. It will stay flat at that temperature for approximately four hours. You can heat it using any heat source. It doesn't, you don't have to have electricity. It keeps the baby warm for four hours, and then you swap in another, another batch. Right? So it's this paraffin material inside of a kind of a sleeping bag kind of thing. And so they're proud of their work. as designers and engineers and project leaders are all over the world. But they take it, they take it to where their customers are. By the way, they're in Palo Alto, California, very comfortable, safe, nice place to be, but they are smart enough to go, when they're part way through the project, to go to where the customers will be. They go to rural India and they're showing their prototype and they're honestly listening. They're not talking, they're listening. But what they hear so they show they had an LCD thermometer on it, like that one you just saw. 
And what they hear from one of the young moms in one of these villages is she says, you know, here in this village, we have a lot of respect, by which I think she meant fear, of Western medicines. So if my doctor tells me to give five milliliters of something to my baby, I'll give her three, just to be safe. Just to be safe. Right? And she's just got this mental model of what it is to, you know, protect her child. And by the way, she is, she is really doing what she believes is best. I mean, this is her baby, right? And so when she looks at that LCD thermometer, what she says, what she tells these young designers, is she said, well, if you tell me heat it to 37, I'll heat it to maybe 31, 32, just to be safe. Right, it's so tempting, especially if you're an engineer, as some of the members of the team were, it's so tempting to say, well, these are stupid people, and we're only going to sell the, sell the smart people. But that's, if you're blending technology with humanity, that's not what you do. You say, these are humans here. And these people aren't stupid. They are, you know, they do have less education than these graduate students from Stanford University who are making the product. But you've got to meet them halfway. You've got to listen to what they say. And so at the prototype stage, they said, uh-oh, must change this. And so they changed the product from having the LCD thermometer to having a check mark. Because can't second guess a check mark. There's no such thing as half a check mark. The new instructions say heat it until the check mark appears and then stop heating it. And that change has probably saved tens of thousands of babies' lives. Right? This, this product is now out in a dozen countries around the world. They've saved tens of thousands of babies with this very, very low cost infant warmer. But had they not, A, taken the time, and B, listen, at the prototype stage, been willing to fail, been willing to start over on one aspect of the product, they would have gone all the way to market with this product that would have ended up being misused. And so, as an experimenter, you gotta be willing to, to try it, listen, try again, do a mid-course correction. And so those two examples I just gave were products, but you can prototype anything, you can prototype change. Right? And so a friend of mine, uh, Jim Hackett, the CEO of Steelcase Corporation for a couple of decades. Jim, when he took over as CEO, he had this big change he wanted to make. He wanted to get his executives out of their offices. And this is really hard to do anywhere in the world. He went to his leadership team and said, hey, guys, it was mainly guys at the time, hey, guys, have you noticed that we're the biggest maker of system furniture in the world, sometimes called cubicles, right? And yet, we live in our private offices. He says, what he said was, to told me is, at that point I could propose big change. You know, I'm gonna blow up your old offices, you're gonna be out there, you know, in the middle of everything. But he, he didn't do that. He did a small experiment. He went to his management team and said, hey, listen, I propose the following experiment. He says, I would like you to join me in the open air leadership community. He branded his experiment. He agreed to do the experiment himself. He says, and I want you to give this an honest try for six months. That's all I ask of you, he said. And then my promise to you, and it helps that Jim is this guy of deep integrity. He said, my promise to you is whatever is not working at the end of six months, we will fix. He never said, and you can go back to your old office. <laughs> And so they did this experiment. And Jim said, had I done the big change model, I'd have had all seven of my direct reports in my office explaining to why this couldn't apply to them. But he says, when your boss, whether the CEO or not, asks you to do this little experiment, this six month experiment, who could say no to that? Right, like, oh boss, that's not me. Honest try, no. Experiment, no. You know, like, no one could say no to that. And no one did, and no one resisted. And that idea went straight into implementation and they have never moved out of that space, right? He said, you can do big change much, much better if you can do little experiment. And if you do enough little experiments, you've made big change along the way. So the last of the three ideas is about building on the ideas of others, and this is about being part student and part teacher, right? Being very interested and intellectually curious, but also when you see a new idea, to share it with others. Right? And I spent a lot of time in Japan where several years ago, many years ago now, a team that was working on the house brand inside of a Japanese department store, they visited, they went around the world looking for ideas, and they visited a, a grocery store in LA where they saw these generic products. This was, happens to be generic beer. Plain black letters on plain white backgrounds. This was a fad in America. You can imagine why it didn't last long. 
They did not copy that idea. They did not go back to their boss and say, hey, I got it, plain white background, plain black letters. What they did do, though, is inspired by this weird fad of generic products, they created a brand with very simple color scheme and very simple graphics. And that brand, which you have now in Dubai, that brand, let me try that again, is called Muji. And that name Muji, which you know, it sounds unfamiliar in a foreign language, it stands for, it's short for Muji Rushi, which means good stuff, no brand, right? They took that idea elsewhere. They did not copy it. They built on that idea and built their own successful version of the brand, which was so successful, it burst out of the department store. Now there's hundreds of freestanding Muji stores all over the world. And so when you're innovating, when you're building on the ideas of others, you gotta look outside your industry. You gotta in get inspiration from elsewhere. And here's an example from London, where uh, the head of the intensive care unit of a hospital in London was watching one day the Formula One races. I know, you have those, right? Uh, Formula One races in, in Europe. And he was watching the Ferrari pit crew. You know, as the, as the car came into the pit, he said it was beautiful. It's like ballet, it's like choreography. He says those members of the pit crew, they approach the car with exactly the right tools and they perform their function and then when they withdraw, nobody bumps into each other, but it's, it's perfectly choreographed. And then he did this extraordinary thing. He brought that Ferrari pit crew into his hospital. He said, because our group is chaotic. He says, in our group, seconds matter too. And yet we have chaos when a patient comes into the operating room. Chaos for a few minutes until things settle down. So he brought the Ferrari pit crew in. And imagine if you're a doc, especially a surgeon, and your boss brings in these guys with grease under their fingernails. You might be tempted to believe nothing I can learn here. But if you believe in building on the ideas of others, you at least listen. You want to at least hear what they have to say. And here's what happened. When they brought the Ferrari pit crew into the great Ormond Street Hospital, one of the most respected hospitals in the UK, they reduced technical errors by 42% and information errors by 49%, which makes me think, wow, thank God I didn't have to bring my kids to the great Ormond Street Hospital before the Ferrari pit crew. <laughs> right? That is a lot of change in just a few days. Right? Different industry, different country, different culture, and yet they were able to build on those ideas. They were able to adapt and shape and translate those ideas into their unique business. So, like I said, just three things, three ideas that you can do, that you as leaders can encourage people around you to do. Blend your technology with humanity, right? So you get just that right balance, right? And find, try that again. Find safe ways to experiment. At the front end of, end of innovation, we need experimentation because that is how we learn. And last but not least, look, look that one. Uh, build on the ideas of others, which is have the humility to acknowledge that my organization doesn't have the old, all the answers. So we're gonna continuously look outside. We're gonna look at other companies. We're gonna look at other cultures. We're gonna look at other industries for ideas we can adapt and shape and translate to our unique organization. And if you can do those three things well, if you can take those ideas to heart, it'll go a long way towards helping you build and nurture and reinforce your own culture of creative confidence. Thank you very much. شكرا للسيد توم كلي على محاضرته التي امتعنا بها